about uh, the nature of um, zero knowledge proofs and properties primarily in the context of transaction protocols. This is not intended to be a technical talk, nor is it intended to be particularly good. So don't rely on this for any kind of formal definition. This, the idea here is to provide just enough detail um, to kind of indicate what we mean when we talk about zero knowledge properties in transaction protocols and instructions at other level, um, what that might not be. So you have a better understanding of what to do when you see that for use. So um, we intend to still plenty of time for questions at the end, so this hopefully should be very long. Well. Uh, typical disclaimers, these are only my views and don't reflect those of any other person or organization or community. Um, this is just an educational talk, so I'll use this for financial or professional advice. Um, and also thanks to Cake Technologies, who uh, made Cake Wallet, who supported me being here to give this talk, although they did not have any editorial control over the content of this talk. So let's consider a very, very broad, fairly arbitrary classification for how we build transaction protocols. Um, this is not by any means complete, and folks might disagree with this particular classification. But for the purpose of this talk, let's consider three types of players here. Um, constructions, transactions, and protocols. So I'm going to use transaction to mean a type of data structure that is going to be built from kind of cryptographic building blocks, often called primitives. Here I'll just use the, the kind of plain language term for constructions. So when you see constructions, think of cryptographic building blocks. I'll give examples of these. So um, we end up building transaction protocols, which are kind of algorithms and steps and other constructions um, that define, among other things, how we build and assess whether or not a transaction data structure is valid or not. Um, and that's a very, very simplified definition. So constructions are used um, in transactions and protocols, and protocols assess the validity of transactions, among other things. And notably, protocols and constructions have different kinds of security properties. I think it's often kind of muddled that security properties of one end up affecting the security properties of the other. That can sometimes be true, but not necessarily. I'll give examples of this. Um, in general, the security of a transaction protocol is going to rely, in part, on the security of the underlying building blocks that make it, which hopefully should make some kind of intuitive sense. If you want the overarching thing to be secure, then the underlying thing has to be secure. So like I said, we're going to say that transactions are a type of data structure, but they're typically not strictly uniform. They have all sorts of stuff inside them. This depends on exactly you know, what kind of project you're looking at, what kind of construction you're looking at, they could contain a lot of things. Um, in the context of, for example, blockchain applications, and you often have references to either previous outputs that are used as inputs to the transaction, or possibly representations of sets of outputs. Um, we typically generate new outputs in the transaction. We may have different kinds of signatures or proofs, so we're going to talk about particular kinds of proofs um, that authorize the transaction to take place according to whatever consensus rules the protocol dictates. As well as we may have different auxiliary data some applications include uh, memo data or you know, other data that the recipient is going to need to recover the transaction and later use the underlying assets. As we said, transaction protocols effectively dictate, again, among other things, how transactions need to be built and how we determine whether or not they are valid, whether or not the network should accept or reject them. And validity checking is often very complex and can entail a whole bunch of things. So that could involve making sure that any references and outputs make sense. You know, obviously we don't want to be signing for outputs that don't actually exist in our view of blockchain, for example, or that were just made up on the spot that the network didn't already agree with. We typically want to make sure that any signatures or proofs that are intended to authorize the transaction are valid, whatever that means in the context of that signature or proof. Um, any data we probably want to be of an expected and correct form, both to prevent malicious transactions and to prevent just, you know, nonsense junk from being added onto the chain. And we might want to make sure, for example, that outputs are not part of the double spend attempt. So all sorts of things that the protocol can dictate. It's much more formal than this, but these are some informal things we might want to check. And I said that transactions and protocols are basically built from these underlying building blocks called cryptographic primitives, cryptographic constructions. And these are typically very mathematical, very procedural structures and algorithms, very formalized. And you can design these through all sorts of things. Some of them are designed to be more general, and some are designed to be very specific. And that could have different consequences for efficiency and trust and things like that. But they can include all manner of classes of things. They can include signature schemes. Um, you know, we have things like Shore signatures, ECPSA signatures, ring signatures, all sorts of different things. Different kinds of proving systems, which we'll talk in much more detail about. Uh, things like cryptographic commitments that are used to hide data in algebraic nice ways. 
They can include encryption schemes, like public key encryption schemes, symmetric encryption schemes. You can throw message authentication codes in there. You name it. This field is fantastic, and we build all sorts of interesting, fun, and hopefully useful cryptographic instructions. But we're going to talk specifically about proven systems, and that's where zero knowledge, among other properties, is going to come into play. So, we're going to kind of have a very, very generic definition here, is that in certain kinds of proving systems, one entity, we'll call a prover, wants to convince another entity, call that person the verifier. Sometimes for P and B, we'll use names like Penny and Victor, you might see in examples, about the validity of a statement. And we'll talk about what kind of statements you might want to prove things about in the context of blockchain applications in a little bit. But typically, and it's not always the case, but typically, there will be some kind of secret information involved in showing that this statement is valid. But the prover, crucially, does not want to leak any of that secret information to the verifier. The prover wants to convince the verifier that a statement is valid without revealing any underlying secret information about it. So there's typically several different properties that we might want a proving system to have. This is not complete, this is not technical, don't, you know, write papers based on this information. It's an intentionally loaded bag. But one property might, we might want is that a prover can always convince the verifier that a statement is valid um, if it knows the secret information for that valid statement. And we'll typically call that completeness. So effectively, like if I'm an honest prover, proving an honest statement, and I know all the right stuff, I should always be able to convince the verifier. Another property might be that the prover can't, I'm saying meaningfully, convince a verifier that a statement is valid without knowing the underlying secret information. So effectively, I can't cheat. I can't prove a statement is valid and require any secret information if I don't know that secret information. I also shouldn't be able to convince the verifier of an invalid statement. Uh, and I say meaningfully convinced, because in some examples, uh, there is a chance that the prover could fool the verifier, but we want that chance to be very, very low. Either by like, maybe running a system multiple times, or by doing some clever cryptographic tricks. Uh, we typically call that uh, knowledge soundness. So you know, we want the proving system to be sound. Soundness is like, you know, I'm building a bridge, I want the bridge to be sound. I'm building a proving system, I want that to be sound too. You know, you can't mess it up too bad. And the third property, from when it kind of uh, leads to the title of this talk, is that I don't want the verifier to learn anything, particularly about the secret information, except that the statement is valid. So if the statement has associated secret information, I want the verifier not to know that secret information, but only to know that the statement is valid. And there's a very formal way to write that, but I'm not going to write down here. But we call that property being zero knowledge. So a proving system might be complete, it might be sound, and it might be zero knowledge. And there's different variations of this that I don't think are very crucial for this talk. Another kind of uh, related property to this is that a verifier also shouldn't be able to turn around and convince someone else that it knows the secret information. After all, if someone tells you, know, if I'm convinced as a verifier of the validity of the statement, and that involves some secret information that someone else had, if I don't know that secret information and can't learn it, I shouldn't be able to turn around and pretend to be a prover and convince someone else. It's kind of a subtle property, but it's an important one. So let's go through just a couple toy examples. There are several obligatory examples that, you know, if you see an introductory lecture on this, you'll probably see. There's some involving caves and some involving, you know, in this case, colored juggling balls. And I'll give an example here. So this is a kind of an incomplete, you know, analogy-based toy example. So let's say that my friend isn't able to distinguish the color tray in the room, which is not uncommon. So and let's suppose that I have two nearly identical juggling balls, the only difference between them of which is that one is red and one is red. So, my friend can't distinguish those colors and sees them as identical. But I am a person who can distinguish the colors red and green in this example. I want to convince my friend that these balls are of a different color, that they are not identical, but without revealing any information, like which one is red and which one is green, for example. So I want to do this in a way that's maybe akin to being zero knowledge. So let's try to build like a real-world proving system and maybe prove this to my friend. And in a way that has some of these properties or something kind of like so here's my proving system example. So I'll go ahead and hand the two juggling balls to my friend, and one in each hand, and he will put them behind his back. Then he's going to randomly decide whether or not he's going to switch them, left, right, right, left, without me being able to see behind his back. And then he's going to pick one and show it to me. So I saw what the colors were, maybe he switched them, maybe he didn't, then he's going to show me one of them. Then I tell my friend whether or not he switched them, and he'll judge if I'm correct. That's the game here. 
So let's see, do we have properties that are like completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge? Well, we do. To show it's complete, I want to be able to ensure that if the statement is true, that I can distinguish these and that the balls are of a different color, then I can always convince my friend of this. After all, if you switch them, I know which ball is supposed to be in which hand, and if I see one that's not in the expected hand, then you switch them. And otherwise, you do not switch them. So I can always convince him that this statement is true if, in fact, I possess the secret information, namely the distinguishability of the two juggling balls. Is it sound? So again, that means if I actually can't distinguish them, then am I able to convince him meaningfully? Well, if I can't distinguish red and green, I didn't know what the colors were, and after he maybe switches them, I definitely still don't know what the colors are, so I can do no better than guess it. So in this example, it may be possible, just by random chance, to happen to guess correctly. My friend knows whether or not to switch them, and if I'm just guessing, I got about one in two chance of getting that statistic. So in this case, it is possible for me to fool him maybe once, but if we were to continue this game over and over and over again, I'm very unlikely to be able to answer correctly every time. So if we repeat the process, you know, there's a, a, a measure of soundness involved here that eventually may get something wrong. And finally, is it zero knowledge? Well, it is, because in this case, he gains no information about the colors of the balls. I happen to know that what the colors are, and I therefore I know if he switched them or not, but I'm not giving him any information he can use. And crucially, he can't turn around and play this game with someone else, playing the role himself of the prover in this case, because his verifier would be choosing whether or not to switch randomly, and he would gain no information to be able to use to convince someone else falsely that he can distinguish them. Another fun example I like is Waldo. Well, where's Waldo's students? Apparently it's called Where's Waldo in other parts of the world. I learned that. That's cool. Anyway, um, if you don't know this, the goal is to find Waldo in these big pictures in a picture book. And his character looks like that. And he's typically hidden very, very small in this really big, complicated picture that involves a lot of you know, characters that kind of look like him, just a lot of generic characters. I was a kid, I thought these were really cool. That's what they're really cool. But my friend, she is not very good at finding Waldo. And I am very good at finding Waldo. She hands me a Waldo token and says, I bet you can't find Waldo. And I can look at it and say, ah, I do in fact know where Waldo is. I want to convince her that I know where Waldo is, but I want to do it in a way that's akin to being zero knowledge and doesn't give information away about Waldo's location. I also don't want her to be able to turn around and tell someone else, ah, I do know where Waldo is, if in fact she didn't. So let's build kind of a fakey fake proving system for this. Okay, in this kind of a classic example, I take a giant piece of cardboard that's much larger than the Waldo drawing, and I cut out a precisely Waldo-shaped hole in that cardboard. And my friend turns around, and I place the cardboard over the Waldo drawing in such a way that the Waldo is precisely visible through that hole. Then I say, I'm ready, my friend turns around, and then she judges if she can or cannot see Waldo inside this little hole here. And then she'll turn around and I'll secretly remove the cardboard, so you know, she can't figure out where exactly I placed it. So does this have properties like completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge? Well, it does. Completeness is pretty easy. If I know where Waldo is, I can cut out the hole and place it. And she'll look at it, she'll see Waldo, and she'll say, yes, you know where Waldo is. Is it sound? Namely, if I don't know where Waldo is, can I cheat? Well, I can maybe cheat if I happen to just randomly slide the cardboard down, and it happens to land exactly where Waldo is. So, is there a small chance that I can win if I don't actually know where Waldo is? Sure. Is it unlikely? Probably. It depends on who Waldo is. So, there's some measure of soundness here. And, if we needed to play this game over and over again, if a Waldo is wrong, we could, but I'm very unlikely to randomly get it right every time if I don't know where Waldo is. And is it zero knowledge? Namely, does she learn anything about where Waldo is and she does not? This cardboard is giant, I place the drawing behind it, she can see. She gains no information. And she can't turn around later and show someone she knows where Waldo is using the same thing. She didn't gain enough information to do so. So these are some examples of like how, again, with rough analogies, some of these properties might work. But in practice, like in blockchain applications, for example, that often have very complicated transaction protocols, you know, what kind of statements are used in underlying uh, zero knowledge kernel systems? Because these are used. Well, again, in practice, these are very, very formalized. You have to build these mathematical languages, write the statements very formally. Um, but in an informal sense, they might represent some statements in kind of plain English, like these. Um, maybe the statement is, I know the private key for some input in this giant set of inputs. 
but I don't want to reveal which inputs I actually know the private key for, just that I know it. Yeah. Some signatures and proof systems uh, end up involving statements like this. I might want to say that uh, the value that's hidden in this unknown transaction output is within a specified range. Now, those are called range proofs. They're actually very crucially important for different transaction protocols. I might want to say that the value is hidden in this transaction's inputs and outputs, that I'm not revealing to you what the values are, because I want those to be secret. But I want to show you that the balance properly. Namely, that even though you can't see how much is being consumed and generated in a transaction, you know that you want it to balance. Otherwise, I don't know, money stops working. So that's an example of a statement with a hidden uh, piece of data behind it. Or, for example, to prevent double spend attempts, some transaction protocols use things called linking tags, sometimes called serial numbers, nullifiers, depending on the protocol, that are intended to prevent double spend attempts without revealing which, uh, what is being necessarily attempted. Uh, sorry, I'm not saying this one. We want to be able to detect double spend attempts without otherwise revealing information in these linking tags about what they represent. So a statement involving them might say that this linking tag corresponds to whatever input is being spent in this proof without revealing which one is. So in all these cases, there's some secret information underlying the statement, the validity of which you wish to show when you generate a transaction, hence like the verified by the network. Um, so showing that proving systems are complete, that's one of our properties, completeness, is often actually very straightforward. Often it follows if you write out the algorithm, the arithmetic, and the protocol steps in a proper way. Um, showing that they're sound, and again, sound is basically means that the prover can't cheat. Um, that often involves a technique called extraction, um, where you basically build an algorithm to pull out secret values under certain circumstances. And that basically can be used to mathematically show that the prover had to know the secret if it generated something uh, that was verified correctly by the protocol. Showing that it's zero knowledge typically involves a technique called proof simulation. And proof simulation, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, shows that real proofs can't leak data, even if the verifier is trying to do something funky. So zero knowledge basically means we have a proving system with a property that uh, the verifier doesn't learn anything, and showing that the proving system has this property is shown via simulation. So oftentimes, uh, when we talk about you know, what does the actual proof structure look like, oftentimes it comes in a different round between the prover and the verifier. So we usually discuss it initially in terms of a prover and verifier actually interacting and sending data back and forth. But of course, in the transaction protocol context, we're not doing that. We can just generate a transaction that includes a proof without interacting with whoever's going to verify it, which is the whole network. So in that case, there's techniques to take this interactivity and data exchange um, and kind of compress it down to just uh, one round of data exchange. It's technical and I can talk about it later if you want. Um, but in the interactive version, Typically, there's some initial round of data on the top row, top row there, sent between the prover and the verifier, from the prover to the verifier. The verifier will then typically respond with what's called a challenge, and it's random, to the prover. And then, the prover will respond to that challenge to the verifier. And there can be multiple different rounds of this. And then the verifier takes that whole interaction and judges, according to whatever the proving system protocol says, whether or not that's valid. So in our example with the juggling balls, um, I initially, as the prover, uh, set up the balls in a particular order, sent them to the verifier, my friend, who was lying his back. My friend then randomly chose a challenge by possibly switching a knot and then holding up one of the balls. And then the response was, I said that he had switched or not. So that's an example of kind of a prover-verifier interaction. And when we build these so-called simulations, when we're proving that a proving system is or is not zero knowledge, what we do is by designing an algorithm that, if the prover were already given the random challenge value in advance, which crucially it is not, the prover sends data to the verifier first, and then the challenge is sent. When we're designing simulations, the way we do it is we basically say, suppose you move the challenge in advance, then you build an algorithm that can basically generate something that looks like a real proof that would convince the verifier. And you can use that to argue that a real proof couldn't possibly be made. So, when we're proving zero knowledge, we basically build these algorithms and show that they have this property. So, what does this actually get us? Zero knowledge proofs that have these particular properties that work in these particular ways, showing the validity of statements without leaking secret information. Like, what does that typically get us in the real world when these are included in things like transaction protocols? They have other applications, but transaction protocols are kind of the topic we're thinking about today. So, if you have a transaction protocol that contains, as a building block, 
one or more zero-knowledge proving systems. Since zero-knowledge proving systems are components that are used to build, among other things, transactions and their associated protocols. It's important to note that this does not automatically imply, for example, that transactions are just some single, indistinguishable, and uniform blob of nothing. As we talked about before, transactions typically have a lot of other data within their data structures. They may have one or more zero-knowledge proofs, but they also contain input references, output references, auxiliary data, maybe some other different kinds of proofs or signatures, possibly all sorts of things. Making those things look uniform and indistinguishable is often a property of the transaction protocol that we would like, but having a zero-knowledge pro zero proofing system as an underlying component does not guarantee that. That's like a separate design decision you have to make. It also does not imply that transactions don't reveal information, which I think is something that's commonly misunderstood. I think it's kind of commonly understood that, well, if your transaction protocol is built using one or more zero-knowledge proving systems, it must mean that the transaction doesn't reveal any information. But that is not necessarily the case. In particular, a zero-knowledge proving system only keeps secret information used to show the validity of whatever statement is designed to show the validity, and nothing else. It's this little self-contained box. It shows something about a particular kind of statement, and if you do other things elsewhere in your transaction protocol, you don't automatically gain a property of revealing no information. It's possible to carefully design protocols to limit the, uh, limit the revelation of information, but that doesn't automatically come from the systems. And it's not necessarily the case that the transaction protocol even provides any particular privacy properties. I think privacy and zero knowledge are often kind of interlinked, and for good reason. Uh, you know, there is some manner of privacy involved in the secrets of their, uh, in the secrets that are associated with statements. Um, that zero knowledge proofing systems uh, act on. Um, but again, the protocol can involve all sorts of other different steps, different uh, methods and techniques of showing validity that could involve things outside of that proofing system. So it is possible that the transaction protocol might not have particular privacy properties, even though the underlying zero knowledge proofing system has these nice properties. That being said, it is definitely possible to build transaction protocols that do have very nice higher level properties. Um, you know, like transaction balance, or indistinguishability, or unforgeability that you might want. Uh, and oftentimes, those properties of the transaction protocol rely on the properties of the underlying zero knowledge proving system, but not necessarily. An analogy I like is you might say, well, I know that concrete and steel, when put together as a building material, are very strong and very safe. And it's definitely possible to build a bridge out of concrete and steel that is, in fact, very safe. But just because you try to build a bridge out of concrete and steel with the building material does not necessarily guarantee the bridge is safe. I saw the movie Speed starring Keanu Reeves. There was a bridge made out of concrete and steel with a giant gap in the middle of it. That was a very unsafe bridge. They had to jump into the bus. It was really cool. It worked out for them because Keanu Reeves was the protagonist. And that's a movie. But you would not automatically say that every bridge built with concrete steel is automatically safe. It does mean that a safe bridge probably uses the safe building materials, but the converse is not necessarily true. So you have to do a lot of different kinds of design and analysis of your protocol that aren't necessarily guaranteed by the properties of the other components. So here's kind of like my takeaway when I, when I think of components like urban systems versus protocols that use them is that zero-knowledge proving systems are crucial, yet subtle components in a lot of different transaction protocols. And those protocols can be built with useful security properties. So, great. But having a proving system in your protocol, like I said, does not automatically imply that the protocol is secure by whatever definition you're interested in, or that it necessarily has the security properties you want. Analyzing that is different than just analyzing the security of the underlying components, like proving systems. So if you want protocol-level security properties, which you probably do, like balance or affordability or distinguishability of transactions, well, that will often rely on the proving system properties, but they're not one and the same. So my motto here is that a proving system is not a transaction protocol. They are related, they're important, um, they interact with each other, but they are not exactly the same things. So hopefully that is at least a very, very brief-ish overview of sort of what we mean when we say zero knowledge, um, and sort of what we mean when we say we want to air our transaction protocols. Um, so we intentionally left time for questions. How much time do we have for questions? 20. 20. Thumbs up. That means many minutes. So are there any questions about, about how this stuff works or any of this material? I'm happy to answer them. I mean, the common examples of things that you've probably heard uh, use zero knowledge systems, things like
things like the caches protocols, uh, use particular proving systems to do kind of complex statements for all the transaction inputs and outputs. Uh, Monero uses zero knowledge proving systems for uh, range verification. Um, that's um, that kind of plays into properties involving balance of transactions. Uh, all sorts of different projects and protocols use these things. But the security properties of like Monero's protocol and Zcash's 